So uh, I would like to thank Pastor David for inviting me to speak again today. It's always good to come home to King of Glory and see everybody. And you know, each of us looks at Scripture through the lens of who we are and what we've experienced. I'm a counselor, a father, a grandfather, a gardener, a minister, a musician. So all these things kind of shade how I read things. So I would ask you to bear with me as I try to share what's on my heart today. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you've planted in our lives. We just pray that it would bear fruit, that you would give the, the increase in the yield and the harvest. Be with us today as we seek to learn more about you and strive to follow you more. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, right now we live in a world that is in disarray. It's functioning out of fear. Fear of each other, other people. Fear of a virus. Fear of the future. And we've come to re realize that no matter how in charge we feel like we are, that in the matter of moments, a sickness, a market crash, or simply the dev devaluation of other people can wipe us out. As a result, we've often wrapped fear around us to try and keep the world out. All creation is groaning as never before. You can almost hear it gasping for breath any time you step outside. How did this happen? An enemy sowed weeds in the garden. Now, I'm not talking about literal weeds in the literal Garden of Eden, but that enemy sowed weeds in the garden of our heart. And death began not just for humanity, but for all of creation. We sold ourselves to the lowest bidder and often continue to do so. We bow to the false gods of sex, overindulgence, alcohol, drugs, shopping, and a host of other things while allowing social media to take the place of real relationships. In doing so, we've claimed fear as our inheritance. Now, fear is one of the most powerful emotions. And since our emotions are more powerful than thought, often the knowledge that God has redeemed us is swallowed up in fear. How often have I stumbled around knowing I should trust God, but responding out of fear? How often have I trusted what I held in my hand more than what God had planted in my heart? Proclaiming faith while acting on instincts and old patterns of behavior. And creation, it's still groaning. Awaiting the return of Christ when not only we shall be redeemed, but nature will as well. And so the parable. According to Jesus, in this parable, the evil, the weeds, will be cast up and thrown into the fire while the good fruit, the wheat, who are the children of God, will be gathered up and bundled and taken in from the harvest. And so we have a hope. In Romans, Paul writes, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And bear in mind, that hope is one emotion that is stronger than fear. Yes, love is. Perfect love casts out fear. My brothers and sisters, you cannot love without hope. In every relationship, hope is the basis of love. And so when we hope, we begin to cast out fear. But how do we wrap that hope around it so that it, fear no longer controls us? Back in the early 1940s, my, my father and his two brothers grew up in Spencer, Indiana. They had a bit of a reputation. They were known as the Moss Grip Boys, uh, probably more so than even my three boys <laughs> were when they were growing up. Dad even wound up going to Indiana Boys School when he was a teenager. What got him to Indiana Boys School? Well, one night, 
he was out with some friends, and they were probably doing all kinds of things they shouldn't be doing, and he wanted a milkshake. He had worked at a local diner. So he broke into the diner with his friends, and he made everybody a milkshake. Now, that might not sound like enough to get you sent away to Indiana Boys School, but that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, before that time, there is a hill outside of Spencer known as Watermelon Hill. It's known as that because the Moss Grip brothers used to go out with their friends, hide in the woods, and during watermelon season, whenever the trucks were going up the hill and downshifted to make it up the hill and slowed down, they would run out of the woods, hop on the back of the truck, and start handing watermelons back to each other, then just sit in the woods and, and eat their watermelons. Another time, they broke into a local store, the Five and Dime. They didn't steal a thing. They switched every price tag around that they could find. So when the store owner came in the next day, you know, you've got this for $30 that's now a nickel, and this for a nickel that's now $30. He had to close the store for half a day and rearrange all the price tags. It was a mess. One of the reasons they were like this, during the Depression, his father, my grandfather, left and was never heard from again. His mother, a single mother, was working to try and make ends meet for three ruffian boys who were at home. They didn't have a father to guide them. Now, I am happy to report, as of today, all three brothers are happy in heaven because they accepted their heavenly father and they changed the pattern of abandonment that was established by their own father. They learned to love from God the Father and became fathers. They wrapped the hope of the future around themselves, and that's what we do. We change patterns, we break cycles, and we wrap the hope of the future around us. You see, the good news is God has adopted us as sons and daughters. We use the word redeemed, which means bought back. It's the story we live by. Jesus born in a stable, crucified on a cross, buried in a tomb, and ascended into heaven. We have a hope because of Jesus, and we are a people who are called to hope. We're called to bring heaven to this earth, which is why we pray, your will be done on earth, on earth, as in heaven. And through this adoption, we have chosen redemption now to the highest bidder, the one who gave himself for us. Now, it doesn't remove the results of the curse through, that we first chose through sin, the death and dealing with all the weeds and troubles in our life, but it gives us the means to bring hope not only into our lives, but God's life into other people's lives and hope into their lives. Now, how do we do that? As with all of Jesus' parables, there are many layers and many applications. So we're going to take another look at this one from a different perspective. At other times when Jesus talks about sowing seed, he refers to the seed as the word of God and to the field as our hearts. With this story, there's first the ultimate redemption that he explains that gives us hope for eternity. But how does that apply to us now? Well, you're a farmer. Your life is the field. God has sown his word into your life so that you can bear his fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, self-control. But what weeds have been sown into your life once the good seed started growing? Was there an abusive parent who didn't care about you and made you feel like you were worthless? Have you been involved in a relationship that's devoid of feeling and therefore you start seeking other relationships or soothing your emotions in some kind of a substance? Have emotions become so raw that you just try to find something that's going to numb you? This response is living according to the flesh, and it is the harvest of weeds that other people have planted. 
Now, when Jesus talks about planning, he's not talking about the way I garden in neat rows. I've got tomatoes here, I've got beans here, I've got cucumbers here, I've got zucchini here. This is broadcast planning where they're throwing the wheat out onto the field like this. And it starts to grow and it starts to have some seed. And then the enemy comes in, wants to destroy the farmer, starts throwing weeds out in the field. They start to grow. So the farmhands say, what should we do? You want us to go out and pick all the weeds? No. Remember, it's broadcast farming. It's not like going down the row and pulling the weeds with the tomatoes. They go through and start pulling the weeds. They're going to crush all the wheat. They're going to pull up the wheat. He said, wait until the harvest. Then when we get the wheat off the stalk, they throw it up in the air with the winnowing fan, and the wind carries away the chaff, and the seed drops back down, and they have the good seed. We may ask God to remove the seeds, the weeds from our lives, but there's going to be a lot of good things that are crushed and pulled out at the same time. And so as Christians, the good and the bad have grown up together. Love and hate. Tolerance and intolerance. Strengths to deal. Hiding in addictions. It's now time to separate the bad seed from the good seed. And we have to get rid of the weeds by the root. It's not an easy thing to do. It takes honest relationship with each other. It takes being honest with who we really are as opposed to who God created us to be. It may come through counseling, but it will most definitely come through Bible study, prayer, and time spent with Christians who are mature. But all of this by the power of God's Spirit. Setting aside our pride and defensiveness, allowing love to be spoken into our lives. So God has joined with us in the healing of our hearts. He has given us the power to enact positive change by placing His Spirit in our lives. And this gives us hope day by day, moment by moment, trial by trial, weed by weed, this gives us hope. And our reacting through fear will be cast away. We break all these cycles of behavior and learn to walk in faith, trusting in God. And because we have changed, we're able to enact change in society, bring about social justice, societal change. We're able to show value for one another. We no longer live according to the flesh, but we put to death the deeds of the flesh. And instead of being enslaved by our fears, we hold to the truth that God has adopted us, sons and daughters, and hold on to him, our Abba. The first word in Aramaic or Hebrew child learns, Abba, Daddy. And as we display that family likeness, our lives and ultimately the world will be changed. I think scripture is more powerful than anything I could say. So please think about this for a moment as I reread that Romans section. So then, brothers and sisters, are we debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope 
that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Amen.